Good everyone, I'm Stephen Sapelli, Glory Dan, Reverend of Life Church, a Chapel Church, a Preacher Church, I'm a Preceptor Life Church, I'm a preacher law. I'm also a father, a padre, honorary Bible historian. I have an honorary doctor in divinity, humanitarianism, ministry, and metaphysics. I'm a professor of theology. I am a Lord Knight of the First Order of the Holy Order of Saints. And my favorite part, I am a certified human rights consultant, certified by the U.S. Institute of Diplomacy and Human Rights. I am doing a short sermon today called God's Calling for You. Uh, with my with the launch of my human rights uh, campaign, why the United States should adopt the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So today I've been doing some canvassing so in my community. So posting and handing out flyers so for people to sign the petition. Again, why the United States of America should adopt the Convention of the Rights of the Child. The Convention of the Rights of the Child was adopted by the United Nations in 1989. The United States did not sign the convention, however. And during the four years of Trump on uh, the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy for immigration, children were placed in cages. 5,000 children were separated from their families in the highly anti-Christ and highly racist, xenophobic, and again, anti-Christ, God is love. So it's open rebellion, administration policy that did psychological harm to children and to their families, where these children will have decades, decades for them to heal from what happened to them. So in the presentation itself, which I did on Monday, I highly stress why the United States should adopt the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Why we Christians have to stand against hatred and wrong, stand against Christian nationalists, why Christian nationalism is purely antichrist, and why we have to reject them, reject tropism, and reject Project 2025, especially concerning how many human rights violations that will happen because of it, how many human rights that will be taken away from American citizens. And of course, I, as a deliverance minister, I specifically get into the demonic concerning the type of demonic spirits involved, concerning the diabolical obsession, concerning specifically the demonic false doctrines, demon doctrines that make up Christian nationalism. So today's short sermon, however, will actually not be on all of that, but I will link my human rights advocacy campaign in the description for this short sermon. So I'm going to begin with Matthew chapter 25, so from my Catholic edition, so the Ignatius edition, Catholic Bible, second edition. So Matthew chapter 25. Verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes to his glory, and all the angels with him, then he'll sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he'll separate them from one, as one separates from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you a drink? And when do we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, and in prison, and visit you? Then the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these of my brethren, you did it to me. Then he'll say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you accursed, the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, and in prison, and did not minister you? Then he'll say to them, Truly I say unto you, As you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And they will go away in eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
this is the word of the Lord. And in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, Jesus states in no certain terms to his disciples and to us too, as Christians, that what you do to others, you do so unto God. And this is the point of the man say in God's image. We are created in God's image. And God is in every single person that you meet. And I'm going to be quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer here. So God's every single person that you meet. As long as there are people, God will walk the earth as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls you, speaks to you, makes demands of you. This is a great blessing. It's the Advent message. Christ is standing at the door. He lives in the form of the human being among us. So what you do to others, you do so unto God. And sorry for the loudness and the music and stuff, because I'm in my favorite coffee shop. So doing this short sermon, so Telegraph Coffee Co., which is here in well, Nevada, and of course has the best coffee in town and the best community for that matter. Very welcome, very inviting, and very loving for that matter. A place I definitely go to hang out sometimes, read lots of theology, and teach and preach sometimes. And today, of course, uh, I did ask for them to place a flyer up there, and they allowed it. So, again, why the United States of America should adopt the Convention of the Rights of the Child. So, again, I'll link that into the description of this video. So, again, thank you, Telegraph Coffee, for allowing me to put up the flyer and to do this short presentation. So now that I got that out of the way, let's continue. And I'm going to be taking a couple of readings from my father's devotional book, Why I Keep Blaming the Bathtub. And yes, I'm not actually teaching from a Dietrich Bonhoeffer book today. So. If I can actually find it, so one second. So I'm going to be reading New Testament Grace first. So I was reading in the Old Testament of the book of Zephaniah and saw how God continued to give the people time to repent and get back on track. They were too busy doing their own thing and were not willing to set their junk aside. These people refused to honor both the people of God and the things of God. It wasn't that they didn't know that God was real and that they were being dis directed by him to set aside their disrespectful debauchery. They just didn't seem to take his warning seriously. God gives Zephaniah a final warning for the rebellious people before he declares that they have gone too far. In chapter 2, verse 3, we see that where God even offers a possible escape clause in his decree for those that desire to change. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility, perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Now if Jonah would have been around, he would have been in the I told you so mode because of, of this group, the nation of the Cherethites, verse 5, including his old friends, not the Ninevites, verse 13. It was just that Jonah had been dead around 150 years. As I had read that I can't help but wonder why people that knew that they were operating contrary to the will of God did not listen to the warnings and change their ways. Granted, there were few among them that wanted to return to God and were appalled at the direction the nation was going. They wanted to change but felt helpless against the mass majority. I bet these do-gooders gathered among themselves and spoke about the sickness of the land. They probably even listed, listed the sins of the land in their conversations then they would complain on how their society was so accepting these sins. Sound familiar? Try this exercise. Sit down and write out a list of the sins of the world today. Now see if your list-making process aligns with the process that I use to make my list. Here's a personal confession. When I make a list of sins, it always starts with the sins that I am least likely to get caught up in. You know, their sins. When I get towards the end of my list making, I start to add these sins that I struggle with. You see, in sin list making, I find that by the time I have listed the terrible sins of others, mine doesn't seem like all that big of a deal. I am obviously delusional in my thinking. Back in those New Old Testament prophets, 
When you read of their writings, warnings, and God's actions, you feel a bit more secure because you are a New Testament follower of God and are under grace and not the law. Kind of like you're except for God's wrath, not Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Look again. Is the world really basically any different than it was 2,000 years ago? Has and does God not send us his warnings through his word and with the signs and wonders? Is God, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It all comes down to the personal responsibility. If you are not willing to change you, how can you possibly think that you can change the world? Changing a rebellious generation starts in you. Know you, not that you are the temple of the living God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Sadly, there are folks professing to be Christians that spend all their time looking down from their lofty perch at a sinful world, the same sinful world that Jesus commanded his followers to go and make disciples of. Matthew chapter 20, verses 16 through 20. These are not people different from us. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. In reality, I exist in the midst of the sins of this world, and in fact, I even contribute to the pile. God also, just as he, just like he did in Zephaniah first, chapter 2, verse 3, has called us to a place of repentance and change. We all have been given a choice, a choice with eternal implications. My advantage has nothing to do with how I, in my own strength, made things right. My forgiven sins and salvation are completely based on what Jesus did. All I had to do was come into agreement with him. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Next time I catch myself looking down at them, I pray that God reminds me that I should be looking up at him. Now that is New Testament grace in action. And that is my father's point. We all have sinned and all our short glory of God. We humans are given God's grace. We are given this chance to change, to repent. For again, forgiveness is the changing of ways. So you not only have to change your thinking patterns about things, but you actually have to change your actions. You have to live this new life of change. And again, as I talked about in my presentation, and yes, I talked a lot of theology concerning the, depra the depravities of hatred and its targeted hatred on humans by these fallen Christians who sold their souls for a single human being and have no hope of ever losing heaven. And as I stated also, in that presentation, the theology part, that we as Christians have to stand up against them to make certain that they get the help that they desperately need, both the mental health help and the spiritual help, that they are given this chance to change. And this is the reality. You have to stand against hatred and wrong. You have to do so to protect the victims of hatred and wrong, to and these people given to these dumb, demonic suggestions to harm others and far worse. You have to protect their victims from them. In doing so, out of love, make sure that these, again, these individuals giving these spawn suggestions to help them get into repentance to remove this first hold on them, to remove that demonic influence from them, to help them be restored, renewed. And so standing up against Christian naturalism, standing up against hatred, depravity, for human life, literally, by default, these people, these fixed belief systems that they are superior to others, of course, they place their souls at great risk to do inside to begin with. They're in their rebellion against God since God is love. Hatred is rebellion against Him. Those of hatred, no matter what they profess, are not of love. So again, you as a Christian, you have to stand up against that hatred and make certain that these people, that this first hold on them is...
that they are given this infinite love of God, that they are forgiven, and they are changed. You cannot have repentance without requiring forgiveness. And forgiveness is the changing well, But again, repentance is the changing way. You cannot have forgiveness without requiring repentance. This is the point. You have to require that repentance. This is why, as a the young priest that I am, this is why I do not give blind dispensations. So I'm not the priest you go to you for confession. I, I'm a deliverance minister. I primarily deal with the demonic. I deal with that which gives people compulsion to harm others and far worse. Especially in the localized area, so demonic infestation or major exorcism concerning people who are under vexation. To identify that and eliminate that threat to human life. And I say eliminate as in to remove the demonic influence. And this is why I stayed in no uncertain terms. Why? This one mission that you're given on the earth is to love them. Love doesn't no run to others, love is filling with the law. So you have to, your mission on the earth is, again, is to love others. But you have to try to save as many people as possible. This work of salvation that we are given. This work of salvation, three people. So all these Christian activists, all these idolaters who sold their soul for a single human being, since again, idolatry is what you find as devotion to someone and God or something and God. Or something other than God. So hero worship, this devotion, the transports have to their Messiah. That is idolatry. They sold their soul for a single human being. They no longer have the Holy Spirit. You know, they are under spiritual threat. They are enthralled. Just as the Nazis were to Hitler. It's the same in Geneva that we are seeing today. Again, this is why the Christians have to take a stand against hatred. What happened during the Trump four years where these children were placed in cages, children are precious to God. So that abomination that happened. This is why I'm doing this for you. As a young father that I am, I'm doing this for you. To safeguard as many lives as possible. And this is why I urge you to look at the petition, to read it, read the theology paper, slash presentation paper that's attached to it, and sign it. And share with as many people as possible. To take legal action to make certain there's accountability and to safeguard life. All by peace. Because we as Christians are called to peace. To make peace by peaceful means. To stand up against hatred and wrong, stand for evils of this world by peace alone. By prayer, legal accountability. Because we as Christians, through peace, have to endure suffering ourselves rather than inflict it on others. We must denounce hatred and wrong, denounce violence and wrong. And so doing, we will be called the sons of God. I'm paraphrasing Dietrich Bonhoeffer very heavily there. But this point is there, so I'm going to be going back and reading the chapter, Maybe God Was Directing Me. Again, this is from my father's devotional book, Why Keep Blaming the Bathtub. I'll have this also linked in the description of this video. So, I have been in ministry for a long time, and I'm amazed that there are people that are using the same excuses I used over 40 years ago. Here's a scenario I have witnessed dozens of times. Someone comes to your church, and after a few visits, they start inquiring about a specific ministry that they may be interested in becoming part of. 
Unfortunately, at that time, there is no one ministering in that specific area. The person shares this disappointment with your response and asks why there is no ministering being done in that particular field. They are advised that no one has ever mentioned that particular area of the ministry before. They are then encouraged to develop a plan of action expressing both the local need and initial action that they feel would need to be taken to get involved in that particular ministry outreach. You never hear from them about the issue again. In fact, a short time later they leave the church and let people know that it was because there was no ministry efforts being made in that particular ministry. Does that sound familiar? Maybe you have even had that same thing happen to you when you met your particular ministry that you were interested in. Could it be that God was planning a seed in you because he was directing you to get the ball rolling? Many times, the very thing that we see as a need, God is showing us as a personal calling. Do you know that your ministry calling is? You do have one you know. Here is my story. God placed me into prison ministry over 40 years ago. During that time, he's also moved my family and me several times. Given I am the son of my father, I do remember my family being moved constantly when I was young. But I understood it as my dad's job, and of course being a young child, but the reality is, of course, I followed directly in footsteps, joined the Navy, and became ordained, and I've been doing that free work ever since, so I've been ordained for four years, but I've been doing my deliverance ministry for three plus years now, but continuing on this point. Each of these moves were accompanied with a church search. The criteria for my search had been nothing to do with if a church had an operational prison ministry or not. I knew my calling and trusted that God was going to open the necessary doors for me to continue in what he placed me in. My focus was to find a church that preached Christ and shared how I can live in the power of his resurrection today. I was not looking for a hug or a handshake. I wanted a church being led by a pastor that sought to hear from God and encourage people in being transformed by God into the very image of Christ today, not after they leave this earth. The last few churches that I had been involved with had no prison ministry in place when we started there. Guess what? God used me to start one. There had been times when no one else even got involved, but that did not change God's calling on my life. I continued to minister as he had first led me to do so many years ago. The bottom line is that we all need to ask God what he is calling us to do, and then ask him to direct our steps to accomplish that calling. Don't wait for someone else to get started for you. God may well be calling you to take a step of faith and get the ball rolling. God either placed a burden on your heart, or it may be that you pulled it out of the air as excuse to do nothing at all. Does that sound a bit harsh? Think about it. How many people besides Jonah did God send to Nineveh? Jonah, being of his personal prejudices, ran the other way. Today, he could just tell God that there was no, pre no one presently doing that ministry with the Ninevites so he couldn't get involved. Sounds crazy, but how many times have you done the same thing? Looking back at the times I used that excuse, I have to ask myself if maybe God was directing me. Forgive me, Father, for my hardened heart. And I'll close with that. And again, this is from my father's devotional book, Why Keep Blaming the Bathtub, by Pastor Richardson Hill, my father. And this is the point. You, as a Christian, God has given you a calling. And this mission on this earth for you to do. People are given their spiritual gifts. Some people are led into music, so become musicians, become part of uh, worship teams. Others become ministers of various types, my, my father a prison chaplain, or myself a deliverance minister. And others, of course, are given pastorships and priesthoods concerning their communities. And there are, of course, others 
All of us in general in our daily life, we are representatives of Christ. So again, going back to what I originally stated, what you do to others, you do so unto God. And this is why you have to be very, very careful with how you treat others. Again, God counts everything that you do, every single thought, every single deed, which will be, again, you will be judged by, according to your works. And this is why in my last sermon, and of course in my presentation, I stated outright that you need to be of love. Because the love that you have or have not given others is going to be the love that judges you in the final judgment. As Father Gabriel Amara states concerning this, we as Christians <clears throat> cannot serve God by half measure. What is half measure, you might ask? God has given us everything. We must recognize only Him, adore only Him, and be guided by only Him. Because never believe we do not give to God, we necessarily give to idols. He who is not with me is against me. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. We are either of Christ or we are of Satan. Half measures do not exist for the Christian. Either you are of God, love, peace, or you are of Satan, hatred, and everything else that is Antichrist. So hatred and everything that is open rebellion against God. They're placing children in cages, trying to dominate others. And desiring to dominate, control, to kill about the despise, as these fallen Christians, as Christian nationalists do. And with Project 2025, I have actually read the document, my 160 page manifesto. And in my presentation paper, and in my presentation itself, I highlight which rights will be taken away. Which rights guaranteed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the United States did sign. So, again, love others, love does no wrong to others, and I'm actually going to take up my Bible again. And so, Matt, so it's going to be Romans chapter 13. Love for one another. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loved his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not covet, and then the other commandment are summed up in the sentence. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is, this is Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And here, St. Paul specifically states in no uncertain terms, you as a Christian have to love others. Love does no wrong to others, therefore love's the fulfilling of the law. So sin, outside of the sin of lust, is defined as the harming of others. Again, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And this is summarized, this is sin. This is what our sin is defined as. For again, the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not kill, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the sentence. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love the fulfilling of the law. And for, and for the Christian, there can be no limit as to who your neighbor is. And this is the reality of it. For every single human on this earth is your brother and sister in accordance to God's promise to Abraham to fulfill the coming of Christ Jesus, our Lord, his death, and his resurrection. Every single human is your brother and sister. Every single human God is in. What you do to others, you do so unto God. 
Okay, and I'm going to be switching up and reading Romans chapter 12, The New Life in Christ. And this is something, and I'm giving you the spiritual warning for today. This is something you need to follow. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I bid every one among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think but sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith which God has assigned him. For as in one body we have many members, and all members do not have the same function, so though we may are the one body in Christ, and individually members one of the other. Having gifts that are different according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion in our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in exhor exhortation, he who contributes in liber liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Marks of the true Christian, and this is what you really need to be mindful of and reflect on today. The marks of a true Christian. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, never flag in zeal, be aglow with the spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope, be patient with tribulation, be constant in prayer, Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one for evil. But take thought to what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So do not overcome, do not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. As I talked about in my presentation, and what I talked about for past number of days anyways, do not repay evil for evil. Do not fight against hatred with equal hatred. Lucifer will reap souls even more so because of sloths. And this is the point. Live peaceably with all, if you can. But love, do no wrong to others. Repay no one evil for evil. And this is the point. And our enemies at, are defined as those whose hearts are stifled with hatred. Not those we cherish hostility against, but those who have hostility against us. Jesus refused to reckon with such a possibility. I'm paraphrasing Dietrich Bonhoeffer here, but he is on point concerning this. Your enemy is defined as those whose hearts are stifled with hatred. When stifled with hatred, so consumed, dominated by hatred. And yes, there is the demonic spirit of hatred, which gives temptation, demonic suggestion, for those susceptible to harm and kill others. It's subservient to the spirit of murder. And this is why anyone is consumed, dominated by hatred, I classify as a being of hatred. And this is a classification I use as a deliverance minister, considering those under spiritual enthrallment directly from the spirit of hatred. If they've been conceived, they are dominated. They are under vexation. They are not in control of themselves, not for the longest time. And this for Jesus was rather to do and speak believe this is practically proven every single time. And this is why you as a Christian have to have compassion on them. For again, your enemy are those who are stifled with hatred. You have to have compassion on them because they haven't been themselves for the longest.
this time. They've been consumed, they've been dominated, they're under spiritual trauma. Your mission on the third is to save them. To save them all. To protect their victims from them, certainly. To make certain that they get the help that they need. This is why I use it. This is why there is accountability, legal accountability. So outside of doing exorcism, I use that as well in certain psychology. So legal accountability, the person gets the mental health help that they desperately need. They also get the spiritual help that they desperately need. They get to atone for what they've done. They get to repent, certainly. They get to know of God. They are. And again, they get to know of God. They are able to repent. And they are ultimately forgiven. So, this is why you have to hold them, who are mothers, to legal accountability. Apathy to evil is evil. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer defines apathy to evil as silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold guiltless. To not speak is to speak, to not act is to act. And this is by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, my favorite theologian. So again, do not be apathetic to what is happening. Do not be apathetic to Project 2025. Stand up to hatred with love, with compassion, and with accountability. Have compassion on those who have been spiritually wrong. Have compassion on those who have sold their souls for a single human being, their idolatry. You try to save them, but protect their victims from them. Sign petitions, do what you legally can, and above all, pray for them. In prayer, we do vicariously for others what they cannot do for themselves. And this is love. God is our meat. Jesus is our mediator. Through him, we can intercede for others to God on their behalf. We take their perdition upon themselves and plead their case to God. Prayer is a tool I utilize in certain in exorcism. Prayer is what I have to rely on. And that's the thing. I because when it comes to doing field experience and everything with certain actresses and going out to locations that are infested with the demonic, like the suicide location of my community, for example. In other areas. I have to rely on God for empowerment. I have to rely on God for protection. So for that ability to push out the entity that is causing, yeah, giving that compulsion for others to kill themselves in that specific area, or in general, for people to harm others again. In my three plus years of experience doing exorcism, if I want to actively hunt the demonic outside of the occult, all I have to do is look at hatred ending from, and you in particular, is cause and effect. The effect is people are being harmed around me. The cause is individuals giving into the demonic suggestion to harm others and far worse. This is the reality that you are placed in. Through your own actions, you serve either God or Satan. Again, half by do not exist for the Christian. You are either of God, love and peace, or you are of Satan, hatred and everything else as Antichrist, by your actions alone, deeply given. Yeah. Yeah. So, do not stand by to people that are suffering around you. Do not be apathetic to people being harmed around you. Do not be apathetic to human rights violations. Do not be apathetic to rights being taken away. Safeguard human life. Safeguard individuals, the victims of the world's continually contempt, the victims of hatred and wrong. Safeguard life. Every single human is your brother and sister. And 
reports the gospel prompts to Abraham to fulfill the coming of Christ Jesus our Lord. So, again, so I'm going to get back out there and I'm going to be handing out flyers and putting flyers up. So, again, for my human rights campaign, why the United States of America should adopt the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And I will link my human rights campaign to this video. Anyways, everyone, stay safe, God bless, and Don Diaz.